Hey guys, Mr. Jansen here again, here to take you through 81 through 90 of the 100 illustrated ways to pass your science regents. Um, so let's get started. Number 81, the silicon and oxygen tetrahedron is the building block of silicate minerals, the most abundant by mass in Earth's crust. Okay, that's a mouthful, but it's actually right in your reference tables. If you go to the front page of your reference tables, you have your silicon and you have your oxygen, and they're the most abundant in the crust by mass. Okay, it kind of tells you right here, they're the highest numbers, all right? And they're actually found, you know, mostly in, you know, most of the minerals that we are exploring here in earth science, okay? So if you look at your reference tables, for example, and you go to your mineral chart, you look at the composition chart, you're going to see silicon and oxygen all over the place. Silicon and oxygen, you know, here's silicon, silicon and oxygen, silicon and oxygen, you know, silicon and oxygen are found in a lot of uh, um, minerals all over the crust. So they're the most abundant, all right? So that's kind of... Uh, a fun little fact there and this you know this tetrahedron shape this like three-dimensional triangle shape is how the silicon and oxygen are stacked okay and this diagram does a great job of showing you where the silicon is where the oxygen is and how they're kind of arranged in this tetrahedron okay as a region's question it may appear something like this which model best represents the silicon oxygen tetrahedron okay we're looking for that three-dimensional triangle okay and we're looking at you know choice B okay on, okay, number 82, um, arid landscape means steep slopes with sharp angles. Once again, arid means dry, and here's an example of one. So, you know, kind of like a desert region. And, you know, the landscape is going to be very angular, very sharp, okay? So, you know, kind of a little fun fact you want to have memorized walking in. And on the regions, it may appear something like this. This landscape area developed in an arid climate. If the climate of this region were to become humid, the hills would eventually what? Okay, so they're not going to be arid after, a anymore. They're actually going to become a little bit more rounded. All right, um, or choice A, okay? This is kind of leading into number 83, that humid landscapes have um, a smooth area with uh, rounded slopes. So they're gonna be filled with vegetation, grasses, there's a lot of water, it's humid, it's wet, okay? So there's gonna be plenty of weathering to make these landscapes rounded, and there's gonna be a lot of vegetation there. As a region's question, um, it may appear something like this, okay? An area of gentle slopes and rounded mountaintops is most likely due to what, okay? So that's gonna do something to do with the humidity or the climate of the area or choice B, okay? Number 84, mid-ocean ridge, it, where new earth being created, seafloor spreading occurs, okay? So once again, it's a divergent boundary. You have the crust coming up, separating, pushing out the two different sides, okay? And new crust is being created right in the middle here, right at this ridge, okay? So mid-ocean ridge, you don't have to memorize. Once again, that's gonna be in your reference tables, okay? You can actually go to your reference tables and see, you know, um, once again, your plate uh, chart, and you can see any kind of ridge has the arrows going out from one another. So that is a divergent boundary as shown right here, okay? Um, once again, um, as a region's question, it may appear something like this, okay? Which cross section represents the crustal plate motion that is the cause of volcanoes and deep rift valleys found at mid-ocean ridges? Mid-ocean ridges is your key words right there, okay? Um, so once again, you're gonna be with a divergent boundary or choice three, okay? Um, number 85, trenches are where Earth is being destroyed at a subduction zone. So this is a convergent boundary. Once again, you can check the same reference table chart, okay? And you can see, once again, that anywhere you have these blocks, these thick blocks, it's a convergent boundary that, you know, obviously the crust is coming together, okay? Um, and you can see that that's going to be a, a, um, associated with a subduction zone, okay? Kind of like this. Um, cool. As a region's question, it says, diagram below shows the interaction of two tectonic plates. The type of plate boundary represented in the diagram most likely exists between which? So once again, you're gonna use your reference tables for this. You're gonna come and you're gonna check all four of these, all four plate boundaries, okay? And you, you're, you're basically gonna come up, you know, so you, once again, you come to your reference tables, you come to the slide, you're gonna check each plate boundary, you're gonna see where there the block diagrams exist, okay? So you wanna know exactly where the, the block one exists, okay? And it's gonna be uh, choice three, South American plate and Nazca plate, okay? Right there, okay? Or on your reference tables, once again, um, South American plate and Nazca plate right here, okay? Cool, great. Moving right along, uh, we're going now um, to number 86, P waves travel faster than S waves. Okay, P waves, okay? Once again, they're going to travel a lot faster, okay? Um, they can go through liquids also. S waves cannot. S waves only going through solids. Um, you know, and they're going to arrive first at the seismograph station because if they're, you know, 
faster, then they're going to get there first. You use the comparison of a Porsche and a Saturn. Whenever you race a Porsche and a Saturn, the Porsche is always going to win. All right. So it's always going to get to the destination first. All right. P waves are faster. Um, as the region's question, earthquakes generate compressional P waves and shear waves, S waves. Okay, that's what P waves and S waves are. Compared to the speed of the she compared to the speed of the shear waves in the given earth material, the speed of the compressional waves is what? Okay, so P waves are compressional waves. Maybe your teacher used a slinky to exhibit this. Once again, it's going to travel kind of with the slinky, while the S wave is kind of traveling in an up and down pattern. Okay, um, so once again we're going to go with faster. Okay, P waves are always faster than S waves. Compressional are always faster than shear. Okay, 87, P waves pass through liquids, solids, and gases. That's why people hear earthquakes. S waves travel through solids only. Okay, S solids, S solids. So P waves are gonna travel through anything. S waves are actually only gonna travel uh, through the solid. Okay, so here's an example of an earthquake happening. Then the yellow is representing the P waves going through just about any material. Now, the, the going to different materials are actually going to change uh, direction. So they're actually going to cause different shadow zones on the opposite side of the Earth. Okay, there's the P wave shadow zone and the S wave shadow zone. So depending upon where your seismograph station is, an earthquake could occur and you may not get any readings. Okay, or you might get P waves only. Or you might get P waves and S waves if you're close to the earthquake. So it's all about where your seismograph station is located. Okay, cool, great. As a region's question, it may appear something like this: What is the most probable reason for the absence of S waves? Okay, so why aren't S waves getting to your seismograph station? Once again, S waves can't go through the liquid outer core, or S waves can't go through liquids. Great. Number eighty-eight. You need three seismometer stations to triangulate the epicenter of an earthquake. Okay, so once again. One seismogram is going to give you how far away the earthquake occurred. Okay, it's not going to give you where it occurred. It's going to give you how far away it occurred, whether it's, you know, a couple thousand kilometers or whatever. You need three seismograms or three seismometer stations in order to, you know, triangulate or meet them up. Okay, so you need a minimum of three. Okay, and when all three of them meet up, that's where the earthquake occurred. That's your epicenter right there. Okay, um, so a big difference between the words epicenter distance and epicenter location. Epicenter distance is how far away it is. Epicenter location is where it actually occurred. Okay, as a regionist question, it may appear something like this. Okay, um, so once again, they're giving you a seismogram here. We're going to skip down to question number 26. It says, how many additional seismic stations must report seismogram information in order to locate this earthquake? So the keyword here is additional. They're giving you one seismogram. Okay, so now you need an additional two more. So your answer actually is going to be two. Okay, believe it or not. All right. That's a tricky question because we've been saying three all along, but the question's asking you how many additional ones do you need? Okay, great. Uh, number 89, convection currents in the mantle uh, move plates. This is the driving force behind, you know, plate tectonics. The fact that you have hot, you know, liquid rock rising, then cold rock sinking. Okay, this kind of circular movement. You know, a lava lamp is a great example of how convection works. You know, you have the hot Wax heating up, rising up, cooling off, and sinking back down again. Convection is the engine that moves plate tectonics. As a region's question, it may appear something like this. The diagram below shows a portion of Earth's interior. Point A is the location on the interface between two layers. The arrows show in the asthenosphere. Uh, the arrows shown in the asthenosphere represent the inferred slow circulation of the plastic mantle by a process called what? Okay, so we're talking about these arrows here. We're talking about convection, okay, or choice D. Great, awesome. Okay, number 90, the orientation of Earth's magnetic field has reversed with time. All right, so the Earth's polarity reverses, okay? Every, you know, say 100,000 years or so, what happens is the polarity of the Earth actually changes. So if you had a compass and you, you know, lived 100,000 years ago approximately, your compass wouldn't point north, your compass would actually point south. And that changes, you know, every, you know, couple hundred thousand years or so. So... Believe it or not, there are metallic ions in rocks that line up with the polarity of the Earth. So depending upon what the polarity of the Earth when the rock formed was, will depend upon which way the metallic ions line up in the rock, for example. All right. So right now we're at normal polarity. Maybe a couple hundred thousand years ago, we were at a reverse polarity, then normal, then reversed. So at a divergent boundary at a mid-ocean ridge, they're going to separate at an equal rate. So you're going to have this striped pattern on either side of the ridge representing this reverse polarity. So it's going to be a mirror image on one side as it is to the other. Okay. Um, as a region's question, it may appear something like this. So at intervals in the past, the Earth's magnetic field has reversed. The present north magnetic pole was once south magnetic pole, and the present south magnetic pole was once a north magnetic pole. 
A, re a record of these changes is preserved in the igneous rocks that formed at mid-ocean ridges and moved away from the ridges. The diagram below represents the pattern of normal and reverse magnetic polarity in the igneous rocks composing the oceanic crust on the east side of the mid-ocean ridge. So we have one side of the ridge. Okay, they want to know approximately how many million years were required to form the materials shown between A and B in the diagram. Okay, so here's A, here's B. How long did this take? Well, from here to here is like one, all right? You can do this two ways. You can get a piece of scrap paper, measure from A to B, bring that scrap paper down and see how far along it is. Or you can kind of subtract where A is from B is. You know what I mean? So B looks like, you know, 1.8 and A looks like 0.7. So 1.8 minus 0.7 is going to be approximately 1.1 um, or choice three. Great. Cool. That's number 90. Uh, thanks for watching 81 through 90 and stay tuned for our next video. Thanks and have a good day.